I appreciate you doing this, man. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on, Ramon. This is uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. From prime, from hang time to prime time. It's a phenomenal read, man. Um, Thank you. I'm gonna start to finish from the multiple stories that's in there, especially the one I was really interested about with the um, Marvin Gaye. Yeah. The background behind that, him singing for the national anthem. So I just wanted to know, what was your writing process for this book? Ooh, well, <laughs> it was fu it was fueled by uh, by by fear and. Um, and determination, but the writing process, I, to put it very simply, um, I block, I had about, all told it took about 16 months. So I spent 11 months researching and reporting. And then I spent about five months writing. And the, the process was, you know, I, I just, you know, I just, I wanted to cover things or topics that hadn't really been talked about a lot um, in, in, in talking about the history of the NBA or especially the 70s and 80s of the NBA. So I wanted to talk about Larry O'Brien. I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the NBA entertainment and, um, and also really get into how David Stern got to be David Stern. So, yeah, I mean, the, it was, it, it was, a lot of it was just, you know, with all, when you do so much reporting, I did, I talked about well over 300 people for this book. At some point, you know, the same, the, 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 the themes kind of present themselves. I think if you dig hard enough and you research hard enough, the, the, the book kind of takes form on its own. So I was very lucky to have people who were very, very open and honest with me about how the NBA was and what it became. And I was lucky enough to have done some previous stories for Slam, Grantland, you mentioned that Marvin Gaye chapter, that's a, that was a, that originated from a Grantland piece I wrote in 2013. So I was very lucky to have some reporting done to begin with, but going deeper with, with the phone calls and the research, it, it made it very clear, like, okay, well, the book is going to go in this direction. It's sort of like, if you coil a, ho a garden hose, you know, the, the hose has a way that it's going to, it's going to turn. And it, it's a matter, and I think it's a matter of just digging deeply enough and call, and calling person after person. Eventually, you, re, you realize, oh yeah, the hose goes this way. Like you, you know, you know, it, it's not supposed to be clumped. Like there's a there's a coil to it. So, you know, I was very lucky to have found the uh, the coil, so to speak. Um, I don't know, maybe about halfway through the reporting, but yeah, it was, yeah, it, it was. It, a lot of it was just trial and error and just kind of digging my way to find to find an answer. And to add to that, you know, at the end of the book, you said uh, you had that you put up, you had more than 300 interviews with different people. Mm -hmm. Now, was it like a goal of how many people you want or you just were trying to find as much information you can to make an ideal book? You know, I, I, the idea, the ideal was I wanted a minimum of 200 people. And if I had more time to write the book, I would have called as many people as I possibly could. Um, because to me, the more people that you interview, the, the, the better your book is. I mean, if you look at um, a, a person whose work I've admired for years is Jeff Perlman. And one thing that he does is he calls everybody. I mean, that, that his Lakers book, um, on Kobe, Shaq, and Phil, that's about 300 people. And that's low, that's a low number for him. So in reading Jeff's books, I, you know, what came across was just the legwork that he did and, and the research and the reporting. So I wanted to try, I wanted to do something similar. I wanted to, I wanted to, my theory was, you know what, the more people I talk to, the better the book is going to be. So I wanted, I wanted at least 200. Um, but I, I three three fifteen was a, was a good number for me, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, what, what, was there an ultimate goal? I mean, five hundred. I don't know if I would have had the time to do that. To be honest with you, you know, it's I have to sleep, I have to take care of my kid, so it's um. But yeah, three three hundred was sort of the was sort of that's the seal of approval that I wanted. Um, could I've written a book? Could I've written a good book with two hundred or a hundred sources? I honestly don't know. But to me, it, it felt like this is. To me, there are so many people who, who made the NBA what it was. And not just the players, but you know, everyone from the referees to the, the journalists who covered that and covered the league to 
to um, the, the people that worked in the, in the NBA offices. So to me, this, this is their story. So I wanted to get as many of them to talk to me on or off the record as I could, because it's, it's ultimately not my, my book. It's, it's their story. And I wanted, to, I wanted to do it justice. Out of those interviews, what are some of those interviews that stood out the most and why? Hmm. It's a good question. See, the thing is, the, 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 the obvious answer would be to say, well, talking to, talking to Julius Irving or, 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 sorry, Julius Irving or George Gervin or, or Phil Knight. And, and those are all, like, those are, I mean, those are, you know, those are, I guess, good cocktail party stories. Like, oh, yeah, I talked to Julius Irving. And, but to me, the, the unsung heroes of, of any piece that I've ever done, whether it's, an, whether it's this book or, or articles I've written for, God, at this point now, 10, 15 years for high profile publications, it's always the unsung people. It's always the people that, ha that are, that you never heard of who, have, who, who inevitably provide the best stories or help you out the most. And in terms of helping me out the most, the, the best person there was a guy by the name of Mark Tomashow, who was an executive at Nike. And originally I had contacted Nike hoping that, hey, you know what, I, you know, I, I, a friend of mine, Howie Kahn, who wrote a great book called Sneakers, you know, kind of helped, you know, say, oh, yeah, talk to this person, they'll let you through, da, 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 da. Unfortunately, Michael Jordan wouldn't, wouldn't talk to me for the book. So when Michael decided to decide, decline, Nike was like, no, nah, we're, we're, we can't do this. Because, you know, Michael Jordan is, is Nike. Mm -hmm. So along the way, I did my research and decided, oh, okay, well, I'm going to report around, I'm going to report around this. So in researching and, and reading dozens of books, I came across Mark Tomashow's name in a really good early, docu uh, early book on Michael Jordan, which is called, let me see here, it's called Taken to the Air it's by, uh, uh, by Jim McNaughton. It's an excellent book, or yeah, it's a great book. Um, so, I, so I was like, oh, Mark, that's a name I haven't seen before. So I reached out to Mark on, on LinkedIn, of all places. So emailed Mark, I, I messaged Mark on LinkedIn, he got back to me, he said, look, you know, let's, I'll talk, let's, let's, have a, let's have a conversation. So Mark and I had a, a Zoom call like this for, you know, for maybe 30 minutes. And, you know, he, he after getting over the, the Clyde Frazier uh, poster on my wall, he said, yeah, you know, I'll talk to you for the book. And, you know, you, you seem like you're, you're a good guy. You know, you seem like you, you know, I like what I'm hearing about what you, how you want to report the story and what you're trying to do. So let me, let me, let me make, let me ask some, some people for me. Let me, let me ask some people that I know. I have, I have a pretty good batting average. So within like a week, I'm not, I'm kidding you not. Within a week, like George Gervin was, was on, was on, was on, was, was done. You know, I talked to George Gervin. I talked to Phil Knight was, was, was someone that was, was, was I, you know, I was able to reach Phil Knight because, you know, Mark kind of helped pave the way there. Um, Jim, um, you know, Jim Riswald and, and Bill Davenport, who wrote those great Spike and, and Mike Nike ads, mm -hmm. you know, they were, you know, they were on board and it was just source after source after source that was from that Nike universe um, was, um, you know, what was on board. And that's all because Mark vouched for me. Um, so, you know, again, that's not a, that's not, that's not a great, I mean, he was, when you, when you, when you, when you, in writing a book like this, I, I discovered very quickly that you need, you need allies. You need people that are going to step up and help you and take, take a chance on you. And, and Mark was really one of several people who just went above and beyond in helping me put this, uh, put this book, uh, get this book done. And so that's, so when, when I think of stories like that, when I think of, oh, what's a great source story or a great interview story, Mark, Mark is at the top of the list because that's one of those things where, you know, it was just a LinkedIn, it was just a LinkedIn message and it turned into something that was far, far exceeded what I, um, what I expected. Yeah, because I always tell people, man, oh, don't wait for an opportunity, go create one. Like this, don't don't have the pride. Say, oh, I don't have, I don't want to do it. I don't want to feel embarrassed or anything. Listen, it's yeah. probably a hundred people that's going to turn you down out of fifty that may do it. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you can't to to do to to succeed in writing to be to be a writer, journalist, whatever you want to call it. You have to get used to hearing no, and you can't care. You have to not care. So I, you know. 
I got rejected by tons of people. I mean, Joe Barry Carroll didn't, didn't want to talk for this book. I mean, Joe Barry Carroll. So, I mean, I, I thought that'd be like a layup. Oh yeah, he'll talk. No, I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to just try. The goal here is just to give it your best shot. So like, yeah, try. So you, so you try everybody and if you, if you, and, and you see what happens, but yeah, you can't, you can't be like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, they're not going to want to talk. Ah, I'm not going to give it a try. I mean, you, you, you don't, you never know what's going to happen. And you don't, you don't know. Someone once told me, you know, journalism all, is, is all about if you don't ask, you don't get. Right. And that to me is sort of, I think, the defining, one of the defining traits of, of my writing career. So, like, you know, I'm not a big name. You know, I'm not a, I'm not someone who is, yet written, you know, a thousand bestsellers, but I'll try and I will try until I'm um, until, you know, the wall comes up. So yeah, you have to, you have to try. There's, there's no, there's no other way to go about it. Let's talk a little bit about the book. I won't give a lot away, but we have to start about the beginning. Yeah. Uh, three, in, three individuals that played a big part in this book. Mm -hmm. um, J. Walter Kennedy, um, Larry O'Brien, David mm -hmm. Stern. Yeah. Um, while researching this book, out of those three, which one stood out the most and why? Oh, you Larry could probably give, a, give an example of each one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to answer your question, it's Larry, it's Larry O'Brien. Because, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, you, you probably read all the books I have on the NBA, maybe more. And whenever you, whenever you read books about that mention the NBA's ascendancy, you know, it's always, well, David Stern took over for Larry O'Brien in 1984, or Larry O'Brien was the commissioner before David Stern came up. You, you don't know a lot about Larry O'Brien. He's sort of this, he's, 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 not, he's not a very well-known figure in the history of the NBA. And I wanted to know more about Larry O'Brien because it, this is someone who's a, who was the commissioner of the NBA for nearly 10 years. And it was, you know, it, it was, it was, to me, you, you didn't, I didn't really know a lot about him as a, as a basketball fan, as a guy who's read all these books and more, I, I want to know more about Larry O'Brien. So the, one of the first phone calls I made was to Larry O'Brien's son, Larry the third. And, um, you know, I, I, I said, look, you know, I'm writing this book and, you know, I, I want to know more about your father. I want to know more about what he did, what his contributions were what you know why he got into the nba so he said yeah of course like you know I, I he was happy to help and again i talk about allies and people that will lend you a hand so what larry did was was great he's you know he sent me some you know some nba papers he sent me some you know some some background material but then he said you know we we're just talking one day i think we we're just exchanging emails and he said you know you know my you know dad wrote a an unpublished oral history about his time in the NBA. And, you know, it's in, it's in DC. Uh, if you want to come if you want to come by and take a look at it, go out, you, you're, you're welcome to. So I went over there and I read that. I sat in an office for two days and just read that, you know, read this unbound manuscript with his edit, with Larry O'Brien's edits, um, you know, in the column. Wow. And that was an amazing thing because you, you, you got to see more about, about why he took the job, about what he felt his legacy was. And there was a lot of minutia in that book about, you know, on this day, I, I talked to Junior Bridgman. And on this day, I talked to, um, you know, uh, an executive at CBS Sports. But in that, in all that minutia and all that, you know, kind of day plannery stuff, there were a ton of things about Larry O'Brien's life, which I thought were fascinating. And the one thing that I thought was interesting was, he had to be convinced to take this job. Like the, like if, if, if someone, if, if someone got a call to be the NBA commissioner right now, I'm pretty sure nine out of 10 people would take that job. Like within, within three seconds, they would say, yes, I'm down. Like I'll be on the next plane and we'll, you know, I'm, I'm in, but Larry O'Brien had to be cajoled and wined and dined and, and convinced to like, yeah, this is like, you know, take this job because he had been, he was basically retired. He had written his memoirs. He was, you know, he had been out of politics, politics had passed him by. And really that job, I mean, his, re his, his retirement was, he was in that, he was set. And then the NBA came calling and 
he filled a perfect role in that he was, you know, a lot of people dismissed him. Jerry Colangelo, when I talked to him, said, oh, he was a placeholder. Oh, he was a placeholder. But what a placeholder. Because here's a guy that was part of JFK's inner circle. He's part of the Irish Mafia. He was, you know, he was the, the chairman of the, of the Democratic National Party. He was a big deal. So to have somebody of his stature take hold of the NBA, to, to be the face of the NBA, was an absolutely huge, um, an absolutely huge win for the league. Because this is a league that was, you know, for years it was, it, you know, the, the, the franchises were shaky. It was in the middle of drug problems. Whether how big, big those problems were is up to some debate. You know, it was a sport that was, you know, too black. It was too this, it was too that. Mm -hmm. But here's somebody who is just, who, who radiates gravitas and importance and stability. And that's what the league needed. So, and the, the biggest thing too, and in reading and in, in talking to other people for this book and reading the oral history is Larry O'Brien knew how good David Stern was. He knew, he, he immediately, he very quickly made David Stern his right-hand man. He knew what David Stern was capable of and he let David Stern sort of implement his vision for the league while Larry, while, while, while Larry O'Brien could just sort of stand back and just sort of play the role of CEO. So that, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that. I mean, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you know, Larry was, you know, Larry was just at the end of his, at the end of his career. He was tired. He was, he would, you know, kind of didn't really want to be there, but he, he recognized the talent that he had and he nurtured uh, David Stern and he nurtured Russ Granick, who was the deputy commissioner for years. So to me, I, I think one of the true revelations in this book is I think readers get to see a little bit of who Larry O'Brien was, that he wasn't just somebody who was, you know, who was keeping the commissioner's seat warm for David Stern. Yeah, I feel like him, David Stern, being under his wing for that time, it played a big part for years to come. Now that mm -hmm. you see Adam Silver is now the NBA commissioner, him being right. under David Stern wing, that yep. played a big part. And a lot of people, well, you know, with the Eagle, they're really afraid of that successor because they don't want them to outdo them or thinking they're trying to take mm -hmm. their job. It's like, no, they had it in plan. Like, I'm not going to be in this position forever. Exactly. I, I feel much better if there's somebody here that thinks, just not thinks like me, but have the same uh, external views on the game mm -hmm. and business as well. Absolutely. That and that and that's the that's the beautiful part of it. And I bet I will I will bet you, uh, you know, you know I don't know what I have in my pocket two dollars and some and some mints that Adam Silver has somebody who he is who he's grooming. And and if he doesn't, then he will very soon. I mean, he, uh, Adam Silver's been on the job for about five, six years now. Um, so I, I'm willing to bet that there's somebody who, if you talk to enough people in the NBA offices, they'll tell you like, yeah, this person is, is who Adam is grooming for in 15 years or 20 years. Um, you know, and you're right. I mean, I, I'm talking to people for the book. Um, I talked to a few people who worked in the NBA, you know, in the early nineties, mid nineties when Adam Silver was starting to get his, his bearing, starting to work for work in the NBA offices. And a couple of them told me like, yeah, he, yeah, he, from, from the moment I, I saw Adam, you know, kind of enter the NBA, it was very clear that David was going to groom him for, for the next role because he was younger, you know, he was, he needed that seasoning and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the, one of the, one of the cool, to me, one of the biggest attributes a leader can have is knowing that he or she will not be the leader forever. And doesn't and doesn't have the and has the security and the um um ha, i guess has the um maturity to say okay you know what this is who the, i'm going to start building my army and starting to promote somebody from within and i mean and you know larry did that with david stern there was very little argument that david was going to be the next commissioner and I don't remember there being an app, uh, you know, a um, any much internal sniping when Adam Silver made it to the top post because again, it was it was assumed. It was like, all right, well, this this is what's going to happen. David's going to retire. Adam will take over, and same thing with Larry and David Stern in eighty three, eighty four. I want to talk about. Um, let's go back to Larry mm -hmm. O'Brien. 
him for him having not being in that basketball or even sports room, more just being a fan of the sport, basketball. Mm-hmm. Do you think that played a big part of him being successful? Not big as David Stern, but him having that external views and not having like you know biased opinions about the league. That's a good question. I I don't know. That's hard to answer because he was he was pretty. He he was he was you know he didn't really go a lot into that in 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 his in his memoir, but I do think that what made him so so beneficial for the league was just that was his stature, was the fact that he that he, he could go into a negotiating room, and just by the dint of his presence, uh, uh, you know play a role, and he was also somebody who you know he was he was a major part in getting the ABA MBA. Uh, merger off the ground so i mean i think he had that ability to just to just you know to kind of just cut through the chase but but to your earlier point i think not being an nba lifer probably 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 played a role in that because again if you're you know who who inevitably are the people in your life who steer you who steer you right it's the people who have a who are not part who are not part of your day-to-day routine so yeah i i i I would have to think that Larry O'Brien being an outsider, uh, being somebody who was just sort of thrust into this role, um, played a huge role um, in, in in the shaping of the NBA. Because again, he wasn't tied down to, um, he wasn't tied down to, um, uh, 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 he didn't have loyalties. He wasn't in the in the back pocket of any owner. Um, Walt J. Walter Kennedy, you know, he really he really was a he really was aligned with the big market teams. Um, he really was, you know, if you were Buffalo or Seattle, he really wasn't going to hear you out. Um, so yeah, to have somebody who was an outsider, I think that that had an, that had a huge impact uh, on the NBA. You had the, uh, on the on the course of the NBA. Plus, someone like Walt, like uh, Larry O'Brien, who was so skilled in the negotiation um, in the on the uh, on the negotiating table, that 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 didn't uh, that had that didn't hurt either. I want to talk about the TV deals. Um, mm-hmm. Larry O'Brien, you know, he did his small part while his when his during his tenure there, and then obviously subsequently, David Stern took it to another level. Can you mm-hmm. just talk about the history between the TV deals? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, with with television, there was always this sense of the NBA was grateful. Like, okay, you know what? Like CBS ponies up however much million dollars for for four or five years. You know, okay, we'll we'll you know, we'll, we'll take what we can get. Um, but, you know, but as time went on and, and David Stern had more of a role in the NBA's business dealings, what became apparent was how good he was at presenting the NBA as a product. Uh, and, and that's, and that's where, that's the biggest difference between David Stern and Larry O'Brien. Larry O'Brien was a businessman. He was a politician. He was somebody who was just going to get the deal and then move on to the next to the, to the next to the next item on his docket. David Stern saw television as being so much more than just, okay, we have a deal, or you know, we have a deal and that's gonna get us on Sundays or Mondays. He, David, David Stern was so involved in, in what was on your, our screens. He was just, he, he was so, he had just an, an uncanny ability to go into a production booth or, or talk to a producer or, or watch something on the television and be like, that's wrong. Okay, I like that and here's why. This I don't like and here's why. And, I, and because he was so demanding about what was on the screen, I think that led to a better product. What also helped was in 1982, when the NBA renewed its deal with CBS, which wasn't for very much. It wasn't a big deal. It was chump change compared to what Major League Baseball was getting, and especially the NFL. What CBS did was they hired um, they hired uh, an executive producer named Ted Shaker to handle the NBA broadcasts. And because Ted was such a, you know, Ted Shaker didn't just take the property and like, okay, just he he had room to experiment with it because nobody was at CBS was really paying attention to it. So he could go in there and he could, you know, he could hire Pat O'Brien to do an irreverent halftime report. He could, he could get Brett Musburger 
um, and pair him with Tommy Heinsohn or, 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 um, or Billy Cunningham, you know, coaches that knew something about the game that were passionate about the game. And he could, and Ted Shaker could also hire or use Sandy Grossman, who's a legendary TV director and have him present the games as high drama, you know, not just show like, okay, you know, Scott Webman for 15 ball goes in, take the ball out of bounds, bring up the court. He, 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 you know, Sandy Grossman was very much about showing the passion and the energy about uh, in these games, you know, the, the anguish shots of a player missing a shot, you know, the jubilation of a, of a buzzer, of a buzzer beater. So the fact that you had David Stern and the NBA and CBS sports collaborating so intently on these games, which I don't think Larry O'Brien had the energy for at that point, but you had David Stern handling that and you had CBS sports with Ted Shaker saying, you know what, like, we're kind of kids in a candy store here. Like no one's really telling us what to do. There, there's real, we have nothing to lose. Let's try this stuff. Let's try, you know, let's get, let's hire Leslie Visser from the, from the Boston Globe and have her as a sideline reporter. She, you know, she turns out great. Let's get, you know, Pat O'Brien to get Buck Williams, you know, playing the piano. Let, let's do something different. And you had all this enthusiasm and all this, this can do spirit coupled with people who knew what they were doing you know, it was, it was a great, it was a great, it was a great um, combination of factors. And you have David, and when you have David Stern and his eagle eye on top of everything, I mean, that was, that was the difference maker. So yeah, I mean, Larry O'Brien, again, he, he did not have David Stern's creativity, but to Larry O'Brien's credit, he let David Stern go nuts. He, he let David Stern, you know, he gave David Stern the keys to the car. And, and I think that is, that was the the NBA is immeasurably better because Larry O'Brien took a step back and said, "Okay, I know who my right, I know who my, I know who my guy is for for to handle these things that maybe I don't know much about." So let let David Stern handle it and look at look at what we have now. It's it's crazy how much bigger the NBA is compared to the early to mid nineteen eighties. Crazy. If it's one life lesson that you would say that your readers can take from this book, what would it be? I think it would be to be passionate about what you do. You know, I, I, you know, with, with David Stern, he was so pa passionate, excuse me, about the NBA. He was so, and he was, and the thing about him, he's passionate, but he also, he cared so much about his clients. He cared so much about the, about the people that he was doing business with. So, you know, so at the end of the day at the NBA offices, if you, if you didn't, uh, you, you returned every phone call, you know, you, if, if you, if there was a client, a big client, like a Coors, you went out to Colorado and you, you spoke to Dick Strupp or whoever the executive there was, and you just asked them like, Hey, what can we do for you? Like, what, what can we do? You went the extra mile, you were flexible. And I think that's something that a lot of business owners can take from it. And I've taken, I've taken from this. Um, as a writer and as a professional, like go the extra mile. Don't, don't just be locked into, this is how we've always done things and treat the people that are in your life, your allies, your, your business partners, treat them as more, as more than just stepping stones, put them, put them, have them make, invest in their success and they'll invest in yours. And I think that's something that is really, that I've learned a lot of, um, personally and professionally um, in, in, in reporting and researching this book. It's, you know, the NBA now is this, is this giant international multi-billion dollar business, but the roots of it are very personal and they're, and they're, and they're very intimate. And I think the seeds of any, anything worthwhile, whether it's a business, whether it's a relationship, they come from small steps and they come from caring. And I think that's the one, th the one thing about David Stern that maybe got lost in, lost in his, his gigantic legacy is that he cared more than anybody else. And I think if you care, and I think if you put the effort, um, I think you're, you're putting yourself in position for, for great things to happen, whether it's no matter what path you choose. Now for almost every book that I read, I usually, uh, after I'm done with it, I usually run to the back of the book to look at the bibliography of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me going off what you have right here is pretty much 80% I've read. Um, are there any recommendation, uh, recommendations that you um, request for the readers? 
to do oh, the yeah. um, Oh, absolutely, research. yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go off the bibli. I'm gonna go off the bibliography because it's funny. After I, it's funny. Immediately after you do something or you write something, you think of eight other things you should have done. Um, <laughs> you should have done after you write it, and it's the same thing with the bibliography. Um, <clears throat> there, so I'll go off the top of my head here. Um, I would wholeheartedly recommend um, everyone read *The Heritage* by Howard Bryant. Um, it's an amazing book, and it also um, was extremely enlightening in terms of just the role that race and patriotism has played in sports. It's, it's an amazing book. And uh, Howard was a great interview for the book. I was, it was a, a severe pleasure to talk to him. He was, he was wonderful. Um, let's see, what else can I recommend? Oh, um, I, want my, uh, I want my MTV, which is right back there. It's an oral history of MTV by Ron Tannenbaum and Craig Marks, um, which is, which I cannot tell you how wonderful and juicy that book is there are just so many great anecdotes and but it's also really enlightening as to how mtv became this business and how culture changed with it it's an, it's an amazing book i i would buy that uh, i would recommend that to anybody out there who's listening uh let me take a look here looking back here mm, let me see uh oh yep Definitely Foul, the Connie Hawkins story by David Wolf is mm -hmm. a great look at the NBA pre-1976. Um, and it looks at just how, again, how small time the NBA was. And also it looks at really just how small-minded people were in terms of, in terms of dealing with, uh, and we, not much has changed, sadly enough, in terms of handling and cultivating young talent, it's a heartbreaking story about how, how Connie Hawkins lost about, oh, I would say three to five years um, of his, well, more than that, uh, of his youth because of just some inflated betting scandal. It was, it's, it's heartbreaking, but also just really inspirational and really informative. Uh, Ian Thompson's The Soul of Basketball, uh, which looked at the later, later day NBA is a great book. I can't tell you how much. Yeah, you grabbing it? Yep. There we go. It's an amazing, it's an amazing book. I can't tell you how, when I read that book, how impressed I was by the reporting and the perspective. It was, it's a great book. Uh, let me turn around here, if you don't mind. I'll, I'll, I'll peruse. Um, let's see. Oh, Harvey Aronin's um, Selling of the Green about the Celtics. Great book. I mean, just again, looks at, you know, race and, and, and basketball and, and the sort of how the, the Celtics have really made being white kind of a priority for them, which is not mm -hmm. great. Um, I mentioned before, um, let's see, uh, Jim Naughton's taking to the air. Jim, Jim Naughton's taking to the air. I'll, let me just tell you about this. I am shocked personally that so few people have talked about this book. It is a great look at the early part of Jordan's career before he became, you know, before he became the six time world champion and the, um, and sort of the, the brand icon that he, he became. It is, it is just, it's a wonderful snapshot of Jordan from, let's, it's until about like 1990. And it shows just, you know, it kind of explores the things that would become bugaboos in his career down the line, like the Republican, the, 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 the reported, uh, what did he say about the, uh, you know, Republicans buy shoes too, that whole thing. That's a really good book. Um, you know, Howie Kahn's and uh, Alex French's uh, Sneakers, which is up top there, is an outstanding is an outstanding book. It's an excellent compliment to Bobito Garcia. Where'd you get those? Which mm -hmm. um, is a book I have um, I have I held near and dear to my heart. I think any sneakerhead, any hoops head, should read that book cover to cover. And it was um, I, I regret that um, that Bob wasn't available to talk to me, but you know you can't win them all. Um, I'm trying to think. You know that's the thing about basketball. I, I really do think. I mean, baseball is always sort of talked about as being like the literary medium. Like, oh, you know, there's so many great baseball books. And there are. But, man, there are so many great basketball books. I mean, Terry Pluto has written three or four great books. I mean, Loose Balls is mentioned in there. That's a great oral history of the ABA. But um, Paul Tales about the old-time NBA is amazing. 48 Minutes, the book that he co-wrote with Bob Ryan, is excellent. Um, speaking about Boston Globe employees, um, Jacking McMullen's book, um, Basketball Love Story, which is uh, based off of the sprawling ESPN mm -hmm. doc, is really good. That's also with Ray Bartholomew and um, Dan Clores. 
Um, you have that too? Yeah, I, I see you. Grab, yeah. I see you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's, that's the one, uh, that was the, uh, there are so many cool things about writing this book. I mean, talking, talking to folks like you is great. I mean, I, I love it. But one of the cool things about this, about writing this book was just reading all the great stuff. Like there is so many great, ba there are so many great basketball books that it was a joy to research this book. Like it was a, it was a legit joy to sit back with like 24 seconds to shoot and just read that and mark it up and like try and find the dotted lines or to revisit right. David, David Halberson's Jordan biography. It was such a treat just to go back. I mean, Showtime by Jeff Perlman, just such a treat to go back and read, read these books and just, and just, just like let the stuff sink in. It's just, there's so again. And, and after I talk to you, there are probably gonna be like 15 more books that I should, I could have mentioned. It's, right. there is just such a, there's just such a plethora um, of amazing, well-written, insightful books about basketball. And it's, um, it, it, it was a joy to, again, it was just such a joy to just be able to draw upon some of them um, for this book. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know when I watched The Last Dance, and I know I can, I don't know how you felt about it, but I know me reading so many different books, like you said, um, mm -hmm. Playing for Keeps, and yeah, reading uh, Rolling um, Lazing Me book, My Life by Michael Jordan. Yeah, it's a good and book. Also, Bows on the Horn. Mm -hmm. You, you don't still have. I mean, you're side of watching the film and the project, but you already have, already, a clue what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. I didn't want. I didn't watch the Last Dance not because I did. I didn't want to, but right. I was. I, I've been kind of on a basketball fast. Because when you spend two years reading, reading, you know, 25 basketball books and talking basketball, you, you, you know, I, I needed a little bit of a break, though I will be watching the upcoming NBA season. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, that was the funny thing was looking at Twitter and, and listening to the, the conversations. It was, well, yeah, I mean, everyone knows about, like, if, you, if you're a basketball fan and you know a little about, about the history, like, you know about the Jordan 63-point game at you know, at the Boston Garden. You know, that, you know, you know about Larry Bird's comment. And, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the thing. I mean, yeah, I mean the last I'll watch Last Dance because I'm a basketball junkie, and I, I eventually I will once once the book is out in the world and I've, you know, detoxed. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll be watching that and I'll be reading you know you know all these other great books that have come down the pike. But you're right. I mean, it, one of the things that was so funny was was going on Twitter or or listening to like the Press Box podcast and having folks talk about yeah you know like this has been talked about before like this is written in you know, the Jordan rule, or this was written in, you know, Roland's books, or this was written in, you know, in David Halverson's magnificent Jordan biography. Like a lot of this stuff, you know, isn't quote unquote new. Um, and I guess that's one thing I, I wanted to, to do with this book is I, I didn't want to tell the same old stories. Um, I didn't want to, you know, I, I didn't want someone to read this book who's read, you know, all those books and be like, I read that like five years ago, or I read that like, you know, I read that, I remember Peter Vesey talking about that, like, you know, you know, when he was, you know, when he was on NBC, I, I, I didn't want to tell the same old stories. But the beautiful part about basketball is that, you know, as these players get older, like, they'll have new reflections, they'll have new things to talk about. And I guess, and the last dance to me is, it's, it's going to be amazing to see Michael Jordan talk about these things from the, from the vantage point of a 50 year old man now. You know, that, that, that's, or a 55 year old man, that, that I'm interested to see, but, you know, but when you executive produce it, I, I don't know how, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm in either way. Like I'm, I'm totally in either way, but what, what did you think of it? I mean, you said that a lot of the stories you, you've read, but what did you think overall of it? I mean, on a technical aspect, you can see how Michael Jordan controlled a narrative mm -hmm. in certain parts. He, very, he tried to be very transparent, as in the questions that people wanted to know, did his gambling play a big part of his father being killed? Or, mm -hmm. you know, was he really a um, boisterous af uh, athlete on the court and off the court? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the conspiracy theories behind him is open now in this last dance. And I feel like we, as basketball fans, people who are um, historians, they get a better understanding of who, what type of man he is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm definitely going to watch it. I mean, it's funny. I know a lot of the NBA entertainment guys that I talked to, Greg Winnick, um, Don Sperling were involved in, you know, they, they either filmed 
or put together that original material and, um, you know, or they were involved in, in the production of it. So I'm definitely going to watch it. Um, what I liked, what I loved about The Last Dance and just from looking at and just from, you know, reading about it and, and watching like the promos was just the range of people they, they brought on. Like that to me was just phenomenal. Like when, you know, when they brought on like Joe Klein and, you know, all, all these people to talk about, you know, about those teams. I think that to me got me excited because I, I'm, because those people, and those people always have the best stories. Like Joe, I, th I think if you, if you were to talk to Joe Klein, he'd probably tell you 10 great Michael Jordan stories that, you know, he, he, that you've never heard of because no one thinks to ask Joe Klein. Like no one thinks to talk, reach out to Joe Klein as, as someone to talk to. So yeah, I, I'm very interested to see that. I, I think I, I think I need maybe a couple more months before I can sit down and like get my popcorn and my, my, uh, my flavored seltzer and, you know, invest 10 hours. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I don't, I, I'm trying to think of anyone else who would deserve that treatment though. Like that's, that to me is the fun part, but I mean, you could, you could one, you can make one on magic and the Lakers. I mean, that'd be a great one bird and the Celtics. Mm -hmm. You could, you know, make a few of those. Um, and I hope they do. Cause I think it'd be, I think it's, I think it's great to me, the value of, 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 a, of, a, of a, of a documentary like that and maybe a book like this is it gets younger fans who weren't around for that time it gets them knowing, knowing more about the history. And maybe after they watch The Last Dance, they'll read, you know, they'll read Roland's books or they'll, they'll, they'll go read, you know, The Jordan Rules or they'll go, they'll, you know, they'll go back and they'll read, you know, um, you know Sam Smith's old stuff at the, you know, with the Chicago papers. That to me is, I think, the value of, of, of shows like that is that it's, is that, you know, a handful of fans will be like, okay, well, you know, Oh yeah, that's interesting. Okay, well, where can I find out more about that? And you know, the library is a great place for that. Well, like I said earlier, man, this is a great read. Um, Thank you. I, I feel like next twenty years from now, you're going to have some kid writing a report, research project on this, and they have to talk about the history of NBA, and this will be one of their bibles. Oh, R Ramon, that's so nice to say. Thank you. I mean, that's it's. To, to, to hear that from someone, you know, it, it's funny, you, you, you hear stuff like, you hear comments like that from your parents and, your, and people you know, but to hear from someone who, you know, we, we didn't know each other until maybe three months ago when you reached out to me, that, that means the world. And I, I hope so. I hope that, um, you know, I hope that somebody, you know, someone who's, you know, 15 or 16 reads this book and maybe in 20, 30 years, they write, they write a better book based on this. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all part of a spectrum. So yeah, I'm, I'm um, so thank you for saying that. That means that means the world truly. Pete, tell them where they can find you at, man. All right, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you can find me. I think Twitter is pretty much where I I, I live and breathe right now. Um, so at Pete Croato. That's P E T C R O A. Two T's as in Thomas O. Pete Croato on Twitter. Um, Instagram is still sort of nascent. Facebook is just for you know friends and relatives, but. Um, Twitter is where you can find, you know, um, links to um, events that I'll be speaking at over the next few weeks, um, you know, updates, contests, things like that. So yeah, it's um, Twitter is probably the best, uh, the best place for people to follow me. And I'm always posting new articles there. And yeah, that's uh, feel free to follow me. And uh, I, I hope, uh, hope it's not, a, hope it's a good use of your time. <laughs>